another passage a bit uh, further. At the present time, therefore, there is absolutely nothing which the Jews can arrogate to themselves beyond other people. So, in fact, the refusal of mediation in Spinoza amounts to his refusal of chosenness. Jews are not, again, the chosen people, they are not the mediators who can explain to us uh, the not, not only the meaning of scriptures, but also the content of ethics. We are all equal in front of the ethical uh, obedience and commandings of God. Through this, we see that Spinoza fights against the idea of any particular access to God and consequently also against any particular access to ethics. And consequently also, he fights against any particular access to philosophy and democracy as he refuses any nationalist schema. There is no such thing as a chosen people. There is no such thing as a chosen religion. And Jewish people, again, have nothing different from other people. Which also means that God is not jealous. Which also means that God does not love or hate anyone. Because God has no particular name as shown in the ethics. Again, no particularity can ever be used as a mediation to the universal. So it is this very idea that I would like to discuss here in focusing on the issue of language, as I will explain in a moment. Is it possible to genuinely refuse mediation? Is it possible to state that we have an immediate access to the universality of ethics without immediate meaning again? without any mediation, without any particularity, without any singular access to it. This is what I will examine through what Spinoza says about the Hebrew language in the TPT. If it's true, as Levinas says, that in a sense, mediation is always Christian, we'll have to wonder if Spinoza does not subreptitiously reintroduce the particular into the universal by putting at work secretly a certain Christian schema in the understanding of Hebrew language. To consider Spinoza a Christian thinker, even an anti-Semitic thinker, is a very common thing. I wonder if it's not Levinas's contention as developed in his article called The Spinoza Case, published in 1953 in the collection called Difficult Freedom. So in Difficult Freedom, you have this article, The Spinoza Case, which is structured in two parts. First, uh, The Spinoza Case, and then Have You Reread Baruch? Have You Reread Spinoza? So let me situate the context of this article. As you know, Spinoza was excommunicated uh, from the Jewish community in 1656, uh, at the age of 24, he was excommunicated from a community named Talmud Torah, to which his family belonged. He was accused of atheism, and this excommunication involved the ban of any contact with his family or other members of the community. It involved the ban on business and trade, and the obligation to move out the Jewish area. So he had to exile and settled in Rinsburg, where he made a living by polishing spectacle lenses. So the accusation of uh, atheism grew bigger and bigger, and when he wrote the TPT, he had to hide itself, himself, and it was published uh, secretly, underground, in an underground way, and the ethics was published after his death. What interests me is to see that it, this excommunication was also effective for a long time in Israel. Spinoza was officially rehabilitated, rehabilitated in Israel in 1953 only. In a way, the excommunication lasted in Israel also. And he was rehabilitated in 1953 by Ben-Gurion, who said, now, it has been long enough, Spinoza, you can read Spinoza again. And this is why Levinas precisely writes this text, the Spinoza case, to comment upon this rehabilitation. And it's very <coughs> surprising to see that, in a way, Levinas 
finds it normal, what finds the excommunication normal, and is not quite convinced that Spinoza has to be rehabilitated. He starts by saying, the anathema pronounced against Spinoza by the religious, religious authorities of, this, of his day, and the project proposed by Ben-Gurion to lift this condemnation, certainly have a great significance for the glory and influence of Spinoza in the world. It's a case of posthumous justice. So in a way, Rina says it's normal, it's justice, posthumous justice. But at the same time, he states a bit further in the text, we entirely agree with the opinion of our late lamented and admirable friend Jacob Bolkin. Spinoza was guilty of betrayal. Within the history of ideas, he subordinated the truth of Judaism to the revelation of the New Testament. So, for Levinas, there is an effective betrayal of Spinoza, which justifies the excommunication, and the betrayal is the Christian one. Spinoza is a traitor to Judaism because, <coughs> in fact, he's a Christian thinker. And he's a Christian thinker because, as I said, he reintroduces a kind of mediation within the immediacy he um, advocates for in the treaties. So here I intend to examine what exactly this betrayal means uh, in the eyes of Levinas. Why exactly is Spinoza said to be a traitor to Judaism and why a Christian one? As I already said in my seminar, it cannot be, or not only because it presents Christianity and Catholicism in the treaties as the universal religion, or because by scripture he means both the Old and the New Testament. These positions were perfectly natural and usual at the time. In the 17th century, you could only uh, acknowledge Christianity as the official uh, religion. So it's not at that level that Levinas talks about the betrayal. This is something else, because Levinas perfectly knows that Spinoza, the, the official Christianity of Spinoza, was well, he was obliged, was forced uh, to, be, to behave that way. It's not, the, the betrayal is not at that level. It is situated elsewhere. As I said in a secret uh, reference to mediation. And I would like to to situate this uh, secret reintroducing of mediation at the level of what Spinoza says uh, about reading the scripture, interpreting the scripture, and the use of Hebrew language. So scriptures alone, scripture alone, the principle of scriptura sola, to read the scripture alone. What does that mean? It means that in order to read the Bible, we have to use uh, the only resource the only resources of the Bible itself. Again, we don't need any vegetation or mediators. We don't need any teacher. We don't need any authority. In chapter 7 of the TPT, on the interpretation uh, of Scripture, Spinoza brings to life his method, uh, his hermeneutical method. It's the most important chapter of the whole book. He brings to life the first critical and historical method, the first critical historical hermeneutical method, and both Levinas and Ricoeur praise Spinoza for that. This historical method, critical historical method, lays foundation on a very strange distinction which I will comment from now, which is a distinction between truth and meaning. Philosophy has a truth, scripture has a meaning, and to interpret scripture by scripture alone, means that we have to uh, find the meaning of scripture, knowing that this meaning has no truth. What does that mean? Spinoza says in chapter 7, with scripture, with the Bible, we are at work not on, on the truth of scripture, but only on their meaning. It means the meaning implies the context. I quote Spinoza again. Okay. 
I call passages clear or obscure in the Bible according as their meaning is inferred easily or without difficulty in relation to the context, not according as their truth is perceived easily or the reverse by reason. So in order to understand, to understand the Bible, we don't have to refer it, we don't have to refer its content, its content to ideas or external concepts. We have to remain within the text. It's the first <coughs> textual uh, hermeneutical method. We have to remain within the text, which implies that we have to determine in what context it was written. Context means who has written what and when, how literal it is, how me metaphorical, how figurative, what belongs to this prophet, what belongs to that one, etc., etc. But also, it implies to know in what language the Bible was written. And it appears, and the problem appears at that point. The Bible was written in Hebrew, and that's why if we want to be faithful to the context, to the contextual imperative, we have to learn Hebrew. And that's, of course, what Spinoza did. But the problem, as I said, appears at that point. How can we access the Hebrew language? The problem, the paradox which appears in Spinoza's text, is that the problem of the context quickly ceases to be contextual to the extent that the Hebrew has disappeared. Hebrew language has disappeared. And Spinoza knows it perfectly. So we have to know the context, but at the same time, but the Bible has become contextless because we don't have access to the Hebrew language anymore. Hebrew language, he says, in chapter 7, has become corrupted. We have lost it. We just have some fragments of it. But we lack a grammar. We lack a, a serious book which would be able to teach us Hebrew language. So, how can we access Hebrew language if its context contextuality is lost? What does scripture alone mean if we don't have the language, if we cannot know the language in which the scripture were written? Let's not forget that we cannot refer to the truth of scripture, but to the meaning only. But how can we understand the meaning of something which is written in a language that we don't understand because this language is lost? What is the context in the case what is the, the context of a lost context? And here again, we cannot count on mediators because we have no mediators to teach us what, what the Hebrew language used to be. Spinoza is perfectly aware of these contradictions and he answers the problem by bringing to light what we may call a, self, a hermeneutical self-regulative process at work in the Bible. He introduces a very surprising, and this is what I will insist upon now, very surprising new distinction between the meaning of a text and the meaning of a word. He says, what we have lost is the meaning of the Hebrew text, but we have not lost the meaning of the Hebrew words. And he declares, no one has ever been able to change the meaning of a word in ordinary use, though many have changed the meaning of a text. So you have this, we have this very surprising statement according to which the text of the scripture is altered because the language has disappeared. We don't have access to Hebrew language anymore, but still the meaning of the word has remained. The meaning of Hebrew words is incorruptible, rather than that of the text is not. So what has been lost is the text, but not the meaning of the words. Spinoza then dissociates, and this is what we have to understand, the semantic content, content of the message from its Hebrew literality. So there would be a semantic stability of Hebrew outside of the disappearance of its literality. 
That is why we can still have access to the spirit of the text, but not to its letter. And the spirit of the text is the moral content of the scripture. This is what is incorruptible. The letter is erased, but the spirit has remained. The problem is that, as I just said, Spinoza says we have to make a strong difference between meaning and truth. So the spirit of the text cannot be its truth. So what is the semantic stability of a word if it's not its truth? It means that the meaning of the word cannot be its reference, because if it was the thing the word is referring to, then it would be its truth. Okay? So Spinoza doesn't say we have to refer the words to their internal reference or to the things which it, they refer to, because if he did that, it would be a kind of demonstration of the truth of the text. So we don't have the reference, and we cannot, we cannot trust the letter either. So we have to understand that the meaning of the word is, is somewhere in between the reference and the letter. And the spirit, the meaning, is in between the thing we are talking about and the letter which has to be. So the only possibility which remains is that of the signifier. The, the, the meaning of the word, the stability of the words pertains to the stability of the signifier. We cannot trust the signifier because the signifier is the literality of the text and it has disappeared. And we cannot uh, trust the reference because the reference is the truth and the truth has no validity in the domain of the scripture. Only the signifier is stable. Which means that the word can have a meaning by itself outside the text and outside the discourse. This distinction constitutes the genuine difficulty of Spinoza's hermeneutical method, this distinction between the signified and the truth, between the true meaning and the meaning of truth, or the truth of the reference of the thing. So we have the meaning which pertains to the signified, but the signified is neither the signifier nor the truth. Language has not reached us intact, unaltered. But yet, in this transmission of the Hebrew Bible, there is something which remains untouched, and what is untouched is the signifier. We are forced to admit it, Spinoza says. So what is the signifier? It is not linked to an originary purity or authenticity, because if it was, it would be the truth of the word, and truth is out of the question here. What is a signifier for Spinoza? It lays foundation on conventions, what he calls the use of language. Spinoza affirms that we have the same use of the moral words as the Hebrews. We go on using the same type of words that they were using because we hear, we understand the same thing through the moral content that they used to, to understand. The relationship between the signifier and the signifier, and of the signifier with the reference, is purely contractual. What is incorruptible is the convention which unites the word to a signifier. It strangely means that the words have an existence and a usage independent from the language, independent from the idiom, without being ontologically or intrinsically true. So Spinoza develops here a pragmatic concept of the signifier. It's a pure convention, it is not a truth, it is not a letter, it's a pure convention, and this convention is what uh, it, it was, has a duration during, across time, even if the originary idiom is lost. So it means that we have the same conventions as the Hebrews, so we still understand the same thing through the words, even if the liter literarity of language of the language has disappeared. Of course, this difficult passage and these complex distinctions say very much 
about Spinoza's relationship to the sacred, to affirm that there is no chosenness of the Jews, amounts to affirm that there is no chosenness of the Hebrew language either, because we continue to understand the same thing, even if the language has disappeared. There is no such thing as a linguistic chosenness, which also means that there is no sacred language per se, and that Hebrew language is not the sacred language. The sacred only comes from an experience based on convention, based on the use of language, a certain use of language related to the moral experience. I quote Spinoza about the sacred. From this, it follows that nothing is in itself absolutely sacred or profane, apart from the mind. Or another translation says, nothing is sacred extra mentum. So what is sacred is only a convention. So we agree, since the beginning of times, we agree on what is sacred. The sacred is only a signifier. And this is what uh, continues uh, through in every language, even if the Hebrew language has disappeared. But per se, there's nothing sacred. The sacred is only a convention, which is transmitted from one generation to the other, without referring to a true thing or a true reference. So, it means that we, the context, well, Spinoza is then recreating the context of the Hebrew language without the context of uh, the Hebrew, because the Hebrew language is not. We are reviving the repetition of the experience of the Hebrews through the signifier, through the signifier, through conventional meaning of the words. So we, we, we will come back to that, I hope, in the questions, because it's a very difficult point, the autonomy of the signifier, which is not the truth and which is not the signifier which is in between the letter and the spirit. But this is precisely the point of the betrayal for Levinas. This is exactly what he's pointing out as being uh, uh, Spinoza's betrayal uh, toward Judaism. For Levinas, precisely, the distinction between the signified and the truth is precisely impossible. The sacred is the experience of this impossibility, which also confers value to the religious experience as such. We cannot, according to Levinas, make a distinction between the signified and the truth. The sacred is true per se, has meaning per se. And he says, Spinoza's position is unsustainable, because there is a contradiction, according to Levinas, in Spinoza's position, is forced, in the end, to paradoxically reintroduce, as I said to start with, to start with something Christian, his gesture of destructurization, <coughs> in order to affirm both the incorruptibility of the meaning of the words and the independence of this incorruptibility from any particular idiom, Spinoza has, in the end, to refer to a Christian hermeneutical principle. And this is what Levinas very uh, rightly points. He says, in fact, Spinoza has to uh, anchor his thesis of the incorruptibility of meaning somewhere. Where does the stability of the signified come from? It cannot come only from convention, it must be guaranteed by something else. And this is the Christian betrayal, which Levinas found in chapter 12 of the treatise where Spinoza says, according to the saying of the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, this is St. Paul, man possess, he quotes from St. Paul, the epistle of Christ, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. Let them cease to worship the letter. The betrayal lies at the heart of, this, of Spinoza's reference to St. Paul. He has to refer to the Paulinian principle of an interior writing, of a writing of the heart. 
And he quotes simple again, it's because I quote simple again, saying, the time will come when the Lord should write his law in their heart. And the last year, that's the problem and says. So Spinoza is lying, he's betraying what he was saying. In fact, he does not reject negation. He says, there's an autonomy of the signifier, of the signifier, sorry, an autonomy of the signifier, which lies somewhere between the truth and the letter. And this autonomy is founded only on convention. So there's no sacred meaning per se, but in fact it's not true. He has to uh, found the incorruptibility of the meaning in something like an interior writing which is Christian in its principle. In fact, in the last instance, it is the Christ which is uh, which guarantees the stability of meaning because it is written in our hearts. So this is what explains for Levinas that according to Spinoza we can still understand the Hebrew language even if the letter of Hebrew language has disappeared. Because something is remaining and what is remaining is not Jewish, it is Christian. It's because God has written his law in our heart and this is the Christian principle per se. So in fact, according to Levinas, uh, Spinoza, Spinoza's hermeneutical method requires mediation at the highest point. Without the mediator, that is the Christ, without this interior writing, there would be no, well, there, there would be no intelligibility of the Hebrew language and of the content of the Bible. So, he rejects the chosenness of the Hebrews, but he uh, privileges the secret, well, the Christian secret writing of the heart. So, in fact, if he betrays, to, well, he's a traitor to Judaism in favor of Christianity. He rejects one writing in the favor of another. He rejects the, the letter of the text saying Hebrew language is deteriorated, it's corrupted. He rejects Jewishness in favor of Christianity. There's only one authentic writing, which is that of the heart. And Christ is the, well, represents the life of this meaning. So in fact, in the last instance, the signified in Spinoza means Christ, the moral content, is always Christian. Again, the Christ, well, Christianity would be what preserves the integrity of the words, the famous words of the Hebrews. That is why, according to Levinas, it is not possible to refuse a particular access to the universal. Every time you say there is no particular access to the universal, the universal is immediate. It's immediately legible, as Spinoza uh, pretends it is, or assumes it is. In fact, you reintroduce mediation by a secret door, which is what he does in the treatise. It is paradoxically when Spinoza refuses chosenness as a figure of mediation that he requires another mediation, again the Christian one, which appears here as the interior writing. And it's true that in chapter 7, Spinoza opposes, opposes the writing of the heart to the writing of the paper. So, Christianity, in the end, it substitutes for the absence of mediation. It is the mediation of or for the absence of mediation. It means that for Levinas, this is something I hope we will come back to in the discussion, every critique of Judaism, any desacralization of the Jewish text is never neutral but always Christian. There is no deep sacralization which would not be Christian in its essence. So it means that uh, the critique of Judaism, well, the distance which is taken uh, from the Jewish, from the Hebrew language, Sarasa, the distance which Spinoza takes with uh, the chosenness of the Hebrew, the desacralization of the text is in fact always Christian, which means that no desacralization of language is ever possible for living up. So, if we 
generalize the conclusion, it means that for Levinas, all secular critique of Judaism is always Christian. It's always Christian in principle. Because it would refer to a kind of meaning which is written in our hearts. So, one might argue that Spinoza will evolve and change his mind uh, about his fundamental hermeneutical principles as it appears in his last book, which is the political treatise, and his, in his uh, unachieved Hebrew grammar. Okay, at the end of his life, said, uh, I will write myself this Hebrew grammar or substitute for the disappearance of Hebrew language myself and write this Hebrew grammar. Uh, many comment commentators consider that Spinoza operates a, a, a return in, at the end of his life from Latin to Hebrew, both, as I said, in the political treaties and in the grammar. In the end of his life, he declared that Hebrew should even be taught to non-Jews in order to become a universal language. But this either does not convince Levinas, because again, this enterprise of universal universalizing the Hebrew language amounts to another kind of desacralization. Why? Because Hebrew may become universal only if it is mediated by the translator, which revises and refreshes something always already written in the heart of all men, according to a schema which again remains Christian. So according to Levinas, even when Spinoza says Hebrew has to become universal, he remains a Christian thinker. Because he doesn't he still maintains the distinction between meaning and truth. My question initially was, um, is mediation always Christian in essence? And now it becomes, but it follows from that question, it becomes, can deep sacralization of Judaism escape Christianity? Can there be a neutral desacralization of Judaism? Levinas' reaction to Spinoza's project echoes that of Scholem, who, in a letter to Rosenstein, it's a letter that uh, uh, Scholem wrote, writes to Rosenstein in 1926, and it's called A Confession Regarding Our Language. It's about uh, the new Hebrew language, the creation of Hebrew language in Israel. <coughs> The new Hebrew is a kind of desacralized version of the ancient one, of the previous one. And Sholem writes, the moments when the power stored in the language unfolds again, when the spoken word, the reality of our language, gets form and reality again, that moment will place this holy tradition as a decisive token before our people. God will not remain silent in the language in which he has reaffirmed our life a thousand times and more. So here, Sholem develops the idea of a revenge of God against the desacralization of the Hebrew language. He says here that every time we're trying to desacralize the Hebrew language, the violence of this desacralization will come back and seeks revenge. I put from another passage, hmm. the gibberish that we speak, this is modern Hebrew, will not stay submerged forever. It will burst forth again, and in God's voice it will reappear in the land. But this eruption begins his letter, that this country is a volcano, harbors the language. The, re the renewal of the divine voice will not, cannot, come from an unsecular, unsecularized tradition. So the sacred, according to Scholem, cannot be desacralized without awakening God's vengeance. The sacred will always come back. Every time you try to desacralize language, the, the power of language will return. And this is exactly what Levinas argues against, against Spinoza. You're trying 
to decentralize language by isolating the signified. Mm.